I'm Stefan Schalken. Chisholm was something, when I moved back to London, I tried to drop out to Wales and that didn't really work out. So around 77, 1977, I moved back to London. And I thought before I get caught up in a job and whatever life, I would do the thing I've always wanted to do, which was I would go to dance classes and learn to dance. And near to where I was were living, squatting in St Agnes Place in Kennington, there's a place called Newington Butts, which is a bit of a little area just before the elephant. And there were a group of people using an empty shop there. I wonder if they were called X6 then. Oh, anyway, were they a dance organisation then? Dance organisation. Yeah. Anyway, I went to see one of their things and, and there was two of them. It might have been Emily and Mede were dancing in the middle of the road with like, lorries going past them on either side. And they were doing these arabesques and various kind of like controlled dance movements because they're all sort of classically trained or, you know, or contemporary dance trained. And uh, so all these very controlled movements. And I thought that was just fantastic. It was just like, epitomize something that I wanted to do you know to have this could kind of take art out of its frame and you know and put it r not only in the street but this is in the middle of the street I mean, it's beyond what I'd Im imagine could be possible in a way you know what I mean yeah. so then that was great you know that was a good start and I, they did classes so I just joined in and did classes and, and they were fantastically inclusive you know because I was like I wasn't even particularly fit you know honestly I was fairly young still then so I wasn't uh, but uh, I was doing all these classes, um, classical ballet classes, yeah. a lot of uplift and a lot of uh, you know, sort of bar work and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, it kind of got me fit. I did maybe two or three a week. And then, then they finally got Butler's Wolf. Butler's Wolf was opened up. And this fantastic top floor, which was a tea, tea warehouse, had an amazing floor, which was, it wasn't sprung, but it was beautiful floor. So that was all this massive dance space. So that became really a center of alternative dance then. So I was kind of in there and it was all happening. I wasn't part of the collective. The only part of the collective I was there was when they produced a dance magazine called New Dance. And I, I was on that. So that was the entry point to go to, um, go to Chisholm Hill, really, you know. Also what happened there in, in, the, in X6 in Butler's Wharf was that uh, contact improvisation became kind of my form, as it were, something that I could feel much more comfortable with than classical ballet. I didn't have a very good, even then, I didn't have a very good memory for sequence. So if somebody said, do this, 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 I would be lost about four dance steps in, you know, and be going the wrong way or something like that. So I wasn't great at the actual taking those classes and, and being able to perform. But contact improvisation was really something that was amazingly liberating and very enjoyable because it, it included a kind of non-sexual but very open contact with another person in which the point of contact was the sort of way in which you improvise. Kind of feeling weight, you're feeling centre of gravity, you're feeling momentum, but all that information is going through your intuition. That was an amazing experience to, to go in, but also it sort of worked in with my thinking about art not being about an individualistic thing of a, the artist alone, you know, or even making a name for themselves or something like that. But And then when they moved to Chisholm space, the floor was moved. So that was a kind of amazing sort of symbolic thing. And lots of it, contact improvisation classes happened there and I think I probably got more into that and did less uh, the ballet type stuff. And I was also doing something called re-evaluation counselling, which is sort of, has a sort of similar thing. And in fact, one of the people I was doing, first doing contact with was one of the people that also did re-evaluation counselling. And a lot of the X6 people did re-evaluation counselling as well. And that was just a different thing to contact evaluation, but it was a, an agreement by which you, you again, without socializing you know you, you created a space where you met and you exchanged time to talk about whatever you wanted to and you know and broach any sort of emotional states you wanted to talk about and things like that it was and it was agreed that it was um what was talked about wouldn't be repeated outside of the, the session called a session so it gave you a kind of freedom to 
perhaps talk about things you know you wouldn't want to become gossip and things like that and you and you and you developed a kind of trusting relationship with the person you were doing that with anyway so and in a group in a group artist support group it was like everybody took time around the room and it's surprisingly powerful especially in a group actually surprisingly powerful in being able to say things otherwise you just never say you know or feel things and it was okay to burst into tears or or go into a state or something you know what i mean it was okay so that all that was considered to be part of you working through stuff so yeah. that it kind of worked with contact improvisation in a, in a weird way as being innovative i mean contact improvisation was mainly done as twos although you could do it more but much more was tend to be a, a duet yeah. form and um co-counseling was again a duet form although it worked very well as a group um mm, but you know on a regular basis on a sort of weekly basis you tend to make a session yeah so those things underlay underlay these changes and then and then quite shortly into their formation as as chisholm how they got some money or something or whatever to do some residencies yeah um in 86 there was um an open call for two artists in residence which is supported by an arts council scheme called the performance art promoter scheme so there was this pot of money that could be applied for and, and then yeah it was you and Mona Hatoum that were the first mm. performance art artists in residence mm. um for a year not only was it a long time then which I've forgotten but they also kept saying yes to everything you know so they say oh well could we use the gallery downstairs because look it's not being used these weeks oh yeah yeah could we uh, do this? You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know yeah. I mean? But anyway, they kept saying, you know, you can have an exhibition in here. You can, you can do what you want, basically. So I just sort of had all, you know, any, everything I had that needed to be shown or I thought was worth kind of doing. Was yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was a very uh, fecund episode, really, in terms of, you know, what I, what I could do yeah. um, and try out and things like that. It gave me a, a unique space in my yeah. life yeah but it was it was a moment you know it was a moment of trust with the people and like you said it was their first residency yeah i'm really interested in the work that you produced you know during that residency and also beforehand with babes in the wood um what was it that you were exploring or or doing in your work at that time um yeah, I can remember a performance where I crawled through an empty television set as being, I, I was just trying to I kind of, I don't know, any ideas that were an assault on the kind of existing structures of media and society, really. Yeah. Um, I had this anarchistic um, background. Yeah, I mean, when I say background, I mean... I've been thinking about things from that viewpoint for, for many years. So, um, yeah, I think that was, it was the idea was to try and question existing formats and norms of culture, really, mm. and mess with them and play with them in any way I thought, like, you know, with the pantomime thing. In, an interesting idea that, you know, pantomime needn't necessarily be this very formulaic thing. I didn't realise, actually, what I was doing particularly, but... Well, now I realise it's going back to the roots of um, early clowning yeah. and early musical, really. And um, the sort of collective activity seemed quite important to what you were doing as well. Yeah. You'd been involved with Dance Organisation and then X6 and then Chisholm, all of which were collectives. Yeah. Um, and so that was important to you at that time as well. Yes, it, it was definitely a kind of like of a sympathetic context with, within which to to explore the kind of things I wanted to do. Yeah, definitely. I guess um, collective activity challenges some of those traditional notions associated with the individual artist and commercialization of art practice. Yeah. Um, so I can see how that aligned with your position. I mean, I could be critical as well, which maybe is useful that in that at that time it was all very loose. So if I say been doing some of the things I was trying to do in a theatre situation, in a theatre workshop situation, I think I would have got better 
critical feedback. Mm. I mean, I, I can remember a performance I did that didn't work out as well as it could have done, which was to do with um, a gold watch that my my dad's parents or my dad's sister actually mm. had brought from Eastern Poland, which had then turned into Belarus, and that was the way she got the property. This kind of beautiful lakeside house that my dad's parents lived in and my dad used to live in as a child mm. the way she kind of got that property or possessions through to Poland was in in pieces of gold mm. and I and then in 66 you know 20 years later we we got that gold given to us as, as our heritage mm. and um, I did a performance about that watch mm. and I realized I expected too much of the audience you know I didn't really I didn't spend enough, enough time developing, the, uh, and this was done at Chisholm House. Uh, yeah. I got some feedback afterwards anyway, is that I should have sort of made much more of this potent story, you know. And like I said, if I'd been in the theatre situation, I think they would have gone, look, you know, we'll workshop this much more, get more out of you, get more words, get more of a story together. I don't know, something like that, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think that part of the funding like in Chisna, I wouldn't have been to pay somebody to be to give the artist critical feedback at mm. key points of their development. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there wouldn't have been that person, and they wouldn't have felt. And also, there was a sense that you were left to your own devices, and that was a good thing. So you had freedom, but that was freedom also needs critical support, as I understand it now. It's not just a matter of leaving people to their own devices. You know? Yeah. And um, you talked about the, um, you know, the residency sort of providing you with this opportunity to do all of this stuff. Um, um, and the, the way that you were working and also the work that you were doing was, um, you know, experimental and also um, challenging lots of things. What Were there other places where your work was accepted or where you had opportunities to try and to try out stuff um outside of Chisholm yes well the main one the main one which was over a longer period and probably more important was Brixton Art Gallery which was also collectively run mm. and is fairly well documented I mean the the archive there is at, at um, Tate Tate Archive a lot of things came together there like my um Bigos Artists of Polish Origin group Mm. came together because I could get them a big exhibition there so there was a bit motivation for people to come together and then work work as first and second generation immigrants mm. of Polish origin. Brixton Gallery was due to my agency and other people's very inclusive you know and it, we, we were aware of we were sort of aware that uh, having positive discrimination for black artists who tend to, to be put off by a a lot you know at times largely white collective and things like that and look for their own spaces but anyway so all that was countered quite strongly um and and the first work with mona was uh roadworks which was a thing in um which was a whole concept piece by me but had these fantastic people like rashid and, and mona taking part and mm. Carl Aridi and all sorts of people um which was to work in public for 10 days bringing your the evidence of your work back whether it was photographic documentation or prints or whatever back to the gallery on a daily basis and kind of showing the evolution of your work but the work being done in public so the gallery was only a kind of conduit to the public space yeah. the housework piece that you performed at chisenhow that started out outside didn't it moving around different locations and then there was a performance in Chisholm Hall. yes um, it was three-dimensional and sculptural but it was also a, a vehicle to do performance things you know and then the postal art network um project where you went to local post offices um using that public space um as well as the the spaces you know gallery spaces or um dance space yeah, the International Postal Art Network was actually prior to Brixton Gallery and probably, although it didn't have a space or anything like that, it wasn't a collective, but as a network, it was more important probably because quite a lot of the people 
I contacted through that who were kind of a narco underground inspired artists actually moved to London and moved near, near to me. By the time the Brixton had finished, there was this kind of group of people, including people like Matthew Fuller and who then became friends with Graham Harwood and, and um, various people that, that was actually living in South London, you know, together. So uh. that was a kind of ephemeral global network that actually produced quite um, concrete relationships on the yeah. ground through kind of through uh, correspondence and uh, getting to know each other by mm. writing exchanging artworks mm. how did you position your practice at that time would you have said that you were a performance artist um i think i was exploring at that time being an artist because i'd gone to architectural school and had a sort of success with some books which were to do with alternative technology that was the kind of umbrella title of it and things like that. So um, I had to kind of, then I thought, no, I want to be an artist. I'm an artist, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm, I want to be an artist. And I got into sort of various things, but I also had a young child as well, Lex then. Yeah. So I, I used Morley College, which had a crash and, and some really classes led by great people. And I think the performance bit was, I think it was partly just due to practical things like getting a gallery space. I did a whole lot of drawings from Morley that I, I framed in um, broomstick handles. I had this everyday art thing, which is oh. very situationist kind of art inspired, I think. And I got them shown at Oval House, which I was doing classes in. But actually it was at that time, it was easier to kind of get money to do performance art or get support, you know, get space or be shown or whatever. Yeah, but it was a space where there was there was kind of room. There wasn't a great, you know, there weren't like 3,000 performance artists all applying for the same uh, £150 commission or something like uh, that. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a way of working, practical kind of ways to find work. I mean, if I'd found, if I could have shown anything I'd, I'd produce on paper or canvas, who knows? Um, you can never afford a studio. The performance art promoter scheme that Arts Council were advertising for... Um, that was obviously something that they, you know, policy-wise, were trying to promote, um, and and it was it was good, obviously. So that that's interesting as well. Um, you know how how yeah. those things policies affect what you're able to do in some way. Again, again, I suppose I justified putting up the work on the walls that I did at Chisholm by the fact it was documentation of performance or collaboration. Mm. Mm. even the photo day duets were a sort of the whole idea there was a negotiation with somebody else about which pictures you took and where you went to take them you know mm. um you did sort of you know there were the two exhibitions that just had dance space and then the exhibition downstairs in the gallery space but then also there are the publications that you made alongside your work so there were sort of physical objects I suppose and writing that was really important to what you were doing as well as the performance um, yeah. and the ephemeral stuff. Yeah I mean I had this background in doing these successful books in mm. 72 and 74 so I had that kind of I'm broken that barrier of saying hey you know I'm an author or something like that which was in my family it was just something you know it wasn't our type of people who were who produced books who were authors it was just outlandish you know Mm -mm. um so i kind of got through that and uh, and i knew how to and i got through it in a way the way those books were produced i was very involved in the production of them mm. i was talking to the printer and you know i sort of knew how they were promoted so i knew quite a bit i think publication and in terms of if you're working from the outside and you want to it helps to have to produce you know not to expect when well, we did actually that 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 um exhibition got lots of reviews but you know to to to, to make the make the point if you were confident that work was worth doing it was worth making sure that people knew about it as well yeah and i knew that books tended to stick around and they keep circulating you know mm, mm. well i guess that's that was a, the premise the, one of the premises as well for new dance magazine is that this work was really important but there was no way that you know the ballet critic was going to go and start reviewing new dance work so exactly. it was necessary and um 
you know, historically, there's a relationship between uh, anti-establishment or avant-garde movements and the the, the collective journal or um, so, things yeah. like that. So it's 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 a necessary thing needed to explore to provide a language to stuff that doesn't have it um, in the mainstream um, oh, and yeah. to document it as well, like you say, for for the future. I totally agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And my last question is, if you had to describe Chisholm Howe at that time, what would you say it was? Well, it was a very open to experiments and and delighted by people that were ready to show something new or try something out. And it was a kind of feminist space as well. So it was kind of... Um, mm and generally kind of anti-oppression, you know what I mean? So it had, it had quite a deep perspective on, on opening up of art to bigger audiences, bigger, bigger amounts of artists and so on. So I would say it was ahead of its time or at least on the most progressive edge of that, of that whole kind of development. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Um... And thank you very much for talking to me.